Welcome back to The Breakout. I'm your host, Leo Xia, and today I wanted to talk about a topic that we usually don't really think about when we think about fantasy football. Now, Ubi isn't here this week, so I thought this would be the perfect time to take an episode and kind of dive into something more football related rather than fantasy football related. And that question that's always picked at my mind is how much money is too much money for a running back? It seems like every time a running back receives a record breaking contract, Twitter kind of spirals into an outrage. Like this is way too much money for a running back. And I honestly thought that same thing about Aaron Jones when he got re-signed by the Packers. You had AJ Dillon drafted in the second round to replace him and then you decided to give him more money. Um, it turns out I was right, but I was only kind of partly right. The dollar value that a running back sees is one thing, but the actual cap percentage that they take up is another. So in this instance, in the first year of Aaron Jones' contract, he'll occupy 2.4% of the cap. In year two, it'll go up to 4.4%, and in year three, it'll balloon to 8.6%. However, because of the way Jones' contract is restructured, the Packers could cut him after year two for $6.5 million in dead cap and save $12.7 million on their 2023 cap. So the way the contract is structured is super important and it makes Jones's contract extremely team friendly. So I wanted to kind of look at that from a record breaking running back contract lens. I was using Caponomics as a guide for what I should be looking for. And from Caponomics, here's an excerpt. Uh, The top tier of the running back market resides between three to 6% of the salary cap with seven being a rarity in today's NFL. Yeah, it's basically saying we can expect to pay a top end running back three to 6% and Jones in year one and two is kind of occupying within this range at 2.4% in year one and 4.4% in year two. When I was compiling a list together of all of the record breaking contracts, the average cap percentage of a running back uh, in year one is around 4.67%. So Jones is, Jones is around there. We use percentages because percentages hold through no matter the era. The salary cap increases every year and record-breaking running back contracts occur every year. But comparison by percentages allows us to look at historical data to figure out whether or not that record-breaking contract was too big. So what's the metric for success here? Um, I guess what's the common goal of all NFL teams, right? Winning the Super Bowl. When we look at Super Bowl winning teams, here's how much they paid per running back. So in 2013, Marshawn Lynch had a salary cap percentage of 6.91%. And each year afterwards, the highest paid running back was less than 1%. Now we can see if we if we take a look at all of the running backs in general, uh, if you notice the percent of cap column, on average, a Super Bowl winning team is paying their running backs 3.57% of the salary cap. Now there are definitely exceptions on this list, such as Emmett Smith, who's one of the greatest of all time, and Reggie Bush, but those are kind of outliers and not really the rule to follow here. In recent years, no running back on a Super Bowl winning team has breached 2% of the team salary cap. I, I took the liberty of going through and looking at the cap hits for running backs in 2017, 2018, 2019, and most recently 2020. So in 2017, the Eagles had Jay Ajayi at 0.2%, LeGarrette Blunt at 0.7%. 2018, the Patriots had Rex Burkhead at 1.3%, Sony Michel at 1%, James White at 1.4%. 2019, Chiefs had LaShawn McCoy at 1.6%, Damian Williams at 0.9%. 2020, the Bucks had Leonard Fournette at 1.2%, Ronald Jones at 0.9%, rookie contract still, and LaShawn McCoy at 0.4%. So in fact, if you look at all of these running backs, the cost of most of these running backs rooms combined together is less than 4%. Now I kind of believe that the NFL is aware of this phenomenon and with more and more running backs demanding larger slices of this salary cap pie, uh, teams are trying to re-sign their stud players by trying to backload their cap hits to kind of go into a win now mode. And when we were looking through all of this data, if you look at the most recent contracts, such as Aaron Jones, Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, they've had, they have cap hits of less than 4%. So Aaron Jones is 2.4%, Christian McCaffrey 3.7%, Alvin Kamara 2.1%. This is in year one. If you look at their cap hits in year three, you can see that is drastically increased. It's 8.6%, 7%, 7.1% 
way more than what Caponomics suggests you should be paying a high-end running back. So it's not a surprise then that from the last five years of large running back contracts being signed, there are no Super Bowl winning teams. In fact, 64.3% of teams that sign a running back to a huge contract don't even make the playoffs the following year. And only one team out of 28 teams eligible on this list have won the Super Bowl. So why are teams still paying exorbitant amounts for running backs if the formula for winning a Super Bowl involves a balanced running back room? I won't really pretend like I know what it's like to be in a front office, but from a football fan standpoint, one reason could be that running backs are now more dynamic players than they used to be. So running backs that get paid lots of money are usually good players and you know they will produce in the next year. Once you've found that player, that production is kind of hard to replace. Uh, elite running backs are expected to run, block, and catch passes. So if the 2020 Panthers are paying Robbie Anderson 3.8% of the cap and DJ Moore, who's on his rookie contract, 1.5% of the cap, then they can afford to give Christian McCaffrey 3.7% of it. The Panthers can only do this because... Kind of comparatively to Aaron Rodgers, who commands 10% of the cap, Teddy Bridgewater only takes up 6.7%. It's also kind of expected that the Panthers are looking to draft a rookie quarterback, another formula for alleviating cap space. However, since football is such an injury-prone sport, investing a ton of cap into a single player that's not a quarterback or an edge rusher is kind of a poor idea. Now, Caponomics kind of suggests roughly 10 to 12 percent, 13 percent max for a quarterback, and then 12 percent max for an edge rusher. In 2020, we saw an injury to Christian McCaffrey that sidelined him for 374 total yards, costing the Panthers roughly $19,608 per yard and forcing the Carolina to finish 5-11. and 11. Now, There's a rough negative correlation between the dollars spent per yard and a team's number of wins. Let's subscribe to Bill Belichick's school of accounting for a minute. Christian McCaffrey is an elite player, but how many elite players exist? They're in high demand and come in low supply, which makes purchasing this type of player extremely expensive and inefficient. Belichick's philosophy has always been, let me isolate the skill sets I need in my system and break that into multiple players. So I need a power guy, I need a pass catcher guy, etc and he ends up with a 2019 running back room that looks like this. Rex Burkhead, 1.3%, James Devlin, 0.9%, Sony Michelle, 1.0%, James White, 0.6%, for a total of 3.8% for the entire running back room. Now, Belichick ended up winning the Super Bowl with Sony Michelle finishing for 94 yards on 18 carries and one touchdown. Contrast that to the Rams, who paid Todd Gurley 4% of their cap for only 35 yards on 10 carries. Now, did Gurley have an incredible season leading up to the point and was one of the crucial reasons why the Rams were even in the Super Bowl in the first place? Yes, he did. But the investment into a single workhorse running back kind of crippled the Rams when they rested Gurley in the most important game of the year for his knee arthritis. So since this is a fantasy football channel, uh, we kind of have to talk about fantasy implications. Generally, from a fantasy standpoint, if your running back is getting paid big money, that means they're good and they'll keep producing. Alvin Kamara, in his first contract year, put up 1,688 total yards. Dalvin Cook put up 1,918 total yards. And Derrick Henry had a historic season for 2,141 total yards. Even running backs that were on the downturn or sell highs, such as Zeke or Le'Veon Bell in their first years, put up 1,777 total yards and 1,250 total yards respectively. So assuming no injury, on average, you can expect a record-breaking contract running back to put up average 1,327 total yards in their first season. So let's say 1,300 yards, uh, 1,100 yards in their second season and around 1,200 yards in their third season, assuming they're not cut traded, retired, or whatever by their third season. So kind of in conclusion, it's inefficient to pay your running backs big money, even when they're dynamic weapons like Christian McCaffrey or Alvin Kamara. 
they're well worth their production money wise, but you sacrifice roster construction in other ways. Maybe you're sacrificing on cornerback, maybe you're sacrificing on inside linebacker. If you're looking to build a Super Bowl contending team with a running back that occupies more than 3.57% of your cap, history isn't on your side. There's a reason why the Bill Belichicks and the Andy Reeds of the world are consistently successful and that process doesn't include giving your running backs record-breaking contracts. Mama always said, don't pay your running backs. Let's hit the music.